Welcome to our video series all about DNA, where we'll discuss the history of DNA, DNA structure, DNA replication, DNA technology and genetic engineering, RNA structure and function with an introduction of protein synthesis, the details of protein synthesis, both transcription and translation, and we'll finish with a short discussion on gene control. But first, a brief look at the history of DNA, where we'll answer the following questions. Is there a physical basis for heredity? And what molecule is the physical basis of heredity? In other words, what's the genetic material? What's the structure of this molecule? And what is this genetic material doing? Spoiler alert, the mystery molecule's DNA. If that's all you want to know, you can stop the video now. But if you're interested in passing my test, you should continue on with the video. We'll start with Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk who, working for many years with thousands of pea plants, determined that there was a physical basis of genetic inheritance. Based only on his uh, detailed observations and mathematical analysis, he gave us the basic laws of genetics. What's interesting is he had no direct knowledge of DNA, chromosomes, or genes, yet his work correctly predicted their existence. However, the significance of his work was not immediately recognized. Shortly thereafter, in fact, three years later, Frederick Miescher isolated nuclein, a substance found in every nucleus. Later, the name was changed to DNA. This didn't mean much at the time, because this molecule was not connected to the physical basis of inheritance. Mendel's work and its connection to DNA was not yet understood. So all we know now is there, there's this material in the nucleus. But what does it do and what is it for? So we know there's a physical basis of heredity from Mendel, and we know that something's being passed from parent to parent. But the question is, what is it? And that brings us to Griffith's experiment. In 1928, Frederick Griffith was working with two different strains of pneumonia. The smooth-coated pneumonia, the S strain, and the rough-coated, the R strain. When he would inject a mouse with the R strain bacteria, the mouse would live. R strain, a rough coat, was not a disease-causing strain of pneumonia. But if you injected the mouse with the S strain, the smooth coat, the mouse dies. So the S strain made you sick. I remember S and sick both begin with the letter S, and that helps remember which one's which. Then Griffith took the S strain and he heated it. These heat-killed S strain bacteria were then injected into the mouse, and the mouse lives. Then Griffith took some of these heat-killed bacteria, and he poured them in and mixed them with the R strain and created this mixture of R and S strain bacteria. Now the R strain doesn't kill the mice and the heat killed S strain doesn't kill the mice. So when you injected a mixture of the R and S strain you'd predict that the mouse would live. But interestingly enough the mouse dies. Then if you take some of the uh, bacteria that are in this dead mouse and uh, we'll bring a culture over here and we put some of them and let them grow in this culture what's interesting is that these R bacteria are now changed they now cause disease if they still have a rough coat but the genetics of them have changed something in, in their nature has changed they have transformed if you take some of these newly transformed R strain and then inject them into this mouse it dies Griffith had converted harmless bacteria into, into pathogenic bacteria, and the descendants of those were also changed or transformed bacteria. They could cause disease. There had been a transfer of hereditary material. The question was, what is that material? The debate began. What molecule is the genetic material? And in the scientific community, the leading candidate were proteins. Uh, they understood a lot about proteins at the time in terms of their complex three-dimensional shapes and it, it seemed to be the leading candidate for the molecule and cells that could be the genetic material. In 1944, Oswald Avery decided to look at Griffith's experiment again. Taking the S strain bacteria and some mice, he also um, had some R strain bacteria, but instead of mixing heat killed S strain, he took the S strain bacteria and isolated different a extracts. So he isolated some S proteins, and if he mixed the S proteins, just proteins from these S bacteria, 
with the living R bacteria and then injected them into a mouse, the mouse lives. When he took DNA extracts from the S bacteria and he mixed the S bacteria alone, he isolated bacteria, I'm sorry, the uh, DNA of those S bacteria, let those uh, R bacteria grow with these DNA molecules from the S, and when you injected this into the mouse, the mouse dies. Avery and his colleagues concluded that the hereditary material was DNA. The protein extracts from the S bacteria did not transform the R bacteria, but the DNA extracts did. In the early 1950s, Hershey and Chase conducted a series of experiments with viruses to try to answer the same question. Now viruses are interesting because they really only have two components, protein, a protein coat, and a, and a nucleic acid core. And so what Hershey and Chase did is they ran a parallel experiment using radioactive labels. The outer protein coat of, of viruses is high in sulfur, and so in one experiment they used radioactively labeled sulfur to tag that outer protein coat. The nucleic acids of a virus are high in phosphorus, and so in the uh, parallel experiment they used radioactively labeled phosphorus to tag the DNA. And then they let these bacteriophages, these viruses that infect bacteria, infect different cells, and then they just looked for where the radioactive tag was. So when they used radioactively labeled sulfur, uh, essentially just tagging the protein, they found no evidence of radioactivity inside the infected bacteria. And they did find uh, the radioactive labels in the supernate on the outside. When they radioactively labeled the phosphorus core, they found the radioactive tags inside the cell. And we know that viruses can change the genetics of a bacteria. And so this was further evidence that it was DNA and not protein that was the genetic material. Now that we have hints that DNA is the genetic material, we want to know how it works. But to understand how it works, we need to understand its structure. So we need to back our story up and go back to the 1920s when P.A. Levine determined the components of DNA. He found that DNA was composed of four different nitrogen spaces, cytosine, thymine, adenine, guanine, attached to a deoxyribose sugar, and a phosphate group. He concluded that these nucleotides were the building blocks of DNA. However, he erroneously concluded that the proportions of the bases were equal, so he proposed a tetranucleotide. In 1945, or 49, Edwin Shargaff was investigating the uh, makeup of cells and the relative proportions of these nitrogen spaces, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And he looked across all different types of species, from bacteria to fungus to plants and animals, and he found that no matter which type of organism he found, that there was a consistency in the DNA, that the percentage of the DNA that was made of adenine was always very similar to almost exactly the same as thymine, and guanine was equal to cytosine. So he discovered this equality of adenines to thymines and cytosines to guanines, which suggested a double-stranded molecule. With this information and the growing understanding that, gen that um, the DNA was the genetic material, the race was on to be the first to tease apart the exact structure of DNA. Linus Pauling, who had done great work with the structures of protein, uh, made a mistake and proposed the model for a triple helix of nucleotides. About the same time, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin were using X-ray crystallography to determine the shapes of complex molecules. And using X-ray diffraction on some DNA fibers, Franklin produced an image that would give the final clues. What's interesting was that uh, Wilkins wasn't a big fan of Franklin, and while they shared a lab, uh, Wilkins shared this picture with uh, two other researchers, James Watson and Francis Crick. This picture was the last piece that they needed uh, to kind of tease apart the puzzle of a model that they were pretty far along on. This uh, picture gave them some ideas that showed a specific pattern of, of width repeating. And in 1953, Watson and Crick deciphered the structure of DNA as two strands of nucleotides in a double helix. And for this work, they awarded the Nobel Prize along with Wilkins, and Rosalind Franklin was kind of left out in the cold. So if DNA is the genetic material, and we understand its structure, then what is this genetic material doing? How does DNA work? Well, again, we have to go back. In 1901, Archibald Garrod suggested that genetic diseases were due to inborn errors of metabolism, meaning that a genetic mistake was disrupting the metabolic process, which required enzymes. It suggests that the genetic factors determine the working of enzymes. 
This idea was picked up by Beetle and Tatum in 1941 in a series of very complicated or very, uh, very tedious uh, experiments uh, using mutated bread molds. They found uh, evidence to support this idea that Girard was correct, and they developed what's called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. And we're going to talk about this experiment in detail in class in terms of what these pictures mean, but it's pretty interesting and, and groundbreaking. Uh, later, in 1949, Pauling and Aitano uh, kind of modernized this idea and said that it's uh, one gene, one protein, not necessarily one enzyme, uh, as they studied sickle cell anemia and found that this genetic disorder was due to a faulty protein, which then changed the shape of red blood cells. So now we know that what DNA is doing is coding for the production of proteins. So it took about 85 years from the discovery of DNA to confirm it as the genetic material, to determine its structure, and determine how it functions. So what about the next 50 years after that? In 1975, Frederick Sanger developed a method for sequencing DNA, basically allowed scientists to read DNA. Shortly after, in 1978, Genentech, the first genetic engineering company, produced genetically modified microorganisms that could produce human insulin and growth hormones using recombinant DNA technology. And in 1985, Carrie Mulis developed PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, which we can use to make millions of copies of small amounts of DNA without using a cell as the, uh, as the tool, as the factory. And in 1990, the Human Genome Project began with a goal to decode the entire human genome. And also in 1990, the National Institutes of Health approved the first gene replacement therapy. In 1993, Calgen Incorporated produces the first commercially grown genetically engineered food to be granted license by the United States Department of Agriculture. They produced a tomato that was resistant to rotting. In 1996, uh, Dolly was the first successful mammal to be cloned. In 2003, 50 years after Watson and Crick determined the double helix structure of DNA, the Human Genome Project announces the sequence of the human genome with the 99.99% .99 accuracy. So what about the future? Are we in store for designer babies? Or maybe the end of disease as we understand the genetics of the microorganisms that cause them? or possibly the end of hunger as we produce food that's more resistant to drought. Whatever it is, is sure to be interesting and the pace of learning uh, will continue to accelerate. Well, this video serves as our introduction to this larger unit on DNA. Come back for our next video where we take a closer look at the structure of DNA. In the meantime, check out some of the links and notes I have below for some good sites on the history of DNA.